Good evening. Good evening. Yes, come. <laughs> you know, um, there'd never be an understanding between us at all if uh, we keep any kind of a formal relationship. The entire basis of all spiritual teaching is love. And love has to be made uh, evident in our relationships with each other. And that leaves no room for these formalities. Besides that, <clears throat> when there are formalities, you are apt to believe that you're going to hear a lecture. And you may be assured of this, that you're not going to hear a lecture tonight. There's just going to be a talk. I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> as simply as I can, why there is an infinite way, what the infinite way is, and how it functions. It begins with a youth and a young manhood that had within itself a vacuum, a lack of satisfaction, plenty of the things of this world, but no inner happiness. <clears throat> and therefore a search for something that the world calls God, something that I had never experienced and knew nothing about. Out of all that, or out of that little bit, all of this has come. When you go back into the history of mankind, if you go back far enough, you find a very sad-looking race. A world really illiterate, a world in the rough, men and women having to work from sunup to sundown for the barest living. The tools with which they worked were crude, whether agricultural or fishing or house building or road building. Their tools were crude. They labored and there was no printing press. And so there were no books, no manuscripts, no magazines, no newspapers, nothing to read. The only reading material were the handwritten manuscripts that were done in religious circles, monasteries and brotherhoods. And the way that came about was this. We like to think today that all men are created equal. Of course, that never could be true and never will be because we are all differing states and stages of consciousness. And there are those whose thoughts rise no higher than earning a livelihood. There are others whose thoughts rise no higher than sports. There are others whose thoughts rise no higher than warfare, conquering, gain, at anyone's expense. But always, and this has been true throughout all ages, there have been a few who from earliest childhood showed an interest in something beyond what this world had to offer, an inner seeking, an inner craving, an inner searching. And those few inevitably found something 
and it was always something that took them out of the world either into a cave in the hills or the building of a cell or a monastery eventually there were these religious brotherhoods fraternal brotherhoods and always the few the few who wanted something more than what you see here taste touch and smell were led were directed to these places and uh, small groups were formed and eventually societies and here in these caves and in these monasteries and in these brotherhoods handwritten manuscripts were turned out well of course even a small manuscript would take weeks to turn out and therefore in an entire year there couldn't be many copies and so reading matter was limited always to the few who could find where these manuscripts were to be found now <clears throat> as men retired from the world after their first glimpse into something or other something beyond this world they reached realms that the ordinary man knew nothing about some of them reached the realm of mind they fathomed their mind they learned the secrets of mind others went much further and went into the spiritual realm into the fourth dimension the ultimate and uh, so we find a you might say a, a whole society built around these men who have discovered the uh, realm of mind and its secrets and others who have found the realm of God spirit or the fourth dimension and its secrets and uh, <clears throat> so these men meet these men travel they visit each other they discuss their findings with each other they discuss the fruitage of their discoveries and uh, eventually it is revealed to the world that there is outside of this material realm a mental realm there is a realm of mind and wonderful things come forth from this mind if you tap it if you find the way to release these things these powers these activities in the mind but in the same way those who had touched the spiritual realm found something even greater and this is what they discovered they discovered that the human race as such is a three-dimensional universe a three-dimensional man and he is limited entirely to his body and his mind and of course the untrained mind and the untaught mind isn't really much of a mind but actually that is as far as the human can go he can work with his body or he can work with his mind and he can live with his body he can live with his mind he can live with material powers and forces or he can go into the mental realm and find mental forces and mental powers and mental activities but beyond this there is that which has come to be called the real man the spiritual man or the Christ man or the perfected man and uh, 
all of this of an infinite nature is found to be embodied as the consciousness of an individual. In other words, we are only limited to this mind and body and its world until we break through and there discover a presence and a power within ourselves. Now, when this discovery was made, it was also seen that the man who touched the realm of his soul, this fourth dimensional consciousness, was no longer an animal man with animal appetites. He was no longer dependent either on material forces or mental forces. As a matter of fact, coming into the presence of an individual who has touched the fourth dimensional realm automatically causes the laws of matter and of mind to dissolve and disappear. And you have an entire or a whole new universe opened in which man is not subject to the law. He is not subject to the law. He lives by grace. He is no longer living by might or by power, but by virtue of this fourth dimensional consciousness, that which we later come to call Christ consciousness or spiritual consciousness, although in the Orient it is known as the Buddha mind or Buddhi. It all means the same thing. It means enlightened mind, enlightened consciousness. Now, there, back in the dark, dark ages, it was known that we of the human race are the unenlightened mind, the unenlightened consciousness, whereas the moment we penetrate through into this spiritual realm, we are now the enlightened consciousness or the Buddha mind or the Christ consciousness. All of the monasteries and the brotherhoods had this truth revealed to themselves, within themselves, and in their manuscripts. And as men were led, and of course in those days women couldn't be led there because women just couldn't have religion. That wasn't meant for them. Their work was to keep house and run the farm and the babies. And we men, we had all the wisdom. That was our part in those days. And every boy or man who within his own nature was attracted to something higher than his own surroundings eventually found his way to one of those monasteries or brotherhoods and entered and in turn became enlightened. This goes on right down through the centuries until oh two or three thousand years BC the great wisdom schools and mystery schools of India were at their height and uh, revealed tremendous secrets of life but <clears throat> something happened then that happens often on this particular path and that is that some of the seekers get stuck at the mental level and do not go through into the spiritual and when this happens a very sad thing follows you see, when you go through into the spiritual realm, you yourself have no power. You yourself are nothing but this 
enlightened consciousness becomes the all in all of your experience. Paul was to uh, state it in this way, I live yet not I, Christ liveth my life. Others have said it in other ways, meaning that now I can of my own self do nothing but the Father within me. He lives my life. He does these things. Only a few years ago, Saroyan said, I do not live my life. God lives it, and I go along for the ride. And that is virtually what happens when an individual breaks through the physical and mental realms and touches the spiritual. Those, however, who get stuck at the mental level come to make a strange discovery, and that is that you can use the power of the mind for either good or evil. The power of the mind is human. It is not divine, because in the divine there are no powers and no one can use any powers, not even for good. But in the mental realm you can use power, and you can use it for good, and you can use it for evil. And out of that came the original religions of the primitive people, the primitive races. For instance, the Aborigines of Australia. Their religion reached the level of the mind. And in working with the mind, they found that it can perform miracles. Eventually they learned that you can heal. You can really heal sickness with the mind. But then they also discovered that you can kill a man with your mind. So that they developed both angles of mind science. The good uh, priest who did the healing work and the bad priest who did the killing for you. If you had an enemy that you wanted out of the way, you went to this bad priest and he fixed him, and fast. In the Polynesian races, the same thing developed. Their religion reached the mental stage, and they too discovered the powers of the mind, and so they developed a kahuna system. Now. The good kahuna is a healer. He's one of the greatest blessings that you can have around you. He's a rare, wonderful individual. But they also have the bad kahuna. And he is the one also that is ready to put a curse on your enemy or on the girl who won't marry you or the man who isn't doing right by you. This bad kahuna knows how to manipulate the mind and destroy an individual. As you go through South and Central America, you find that they also knew the secrets of the mind. And so religion, which ostensibly was reaching to God, actually was reaching no higher than the mind. Now, <clears throat> We have to skip quite a few centuries in here until we come to the Master, Christ Jesus. And here we find that he had not only discovered one of these brotherhoods, he was a member of it and uh, studied with it for years, and he went through to the spiritual realm. He touched Christ consciousness, he attained Christ consciousness, he attained that mind which we speak of as being also in Christ Jesus. He attained the fourth dimensional consciousness, and now watch what happened in his experience. Here's a man crippled, and the man asks for help. And the master doesn't say that he'll pray to God for him. He merely says, what did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. And he did. 
What happened? Well, on the human level, there are really material laws and mental laws. There are these laws of infection and contagion and paralysis. There are these laws of age. There are these laws of climate and of weather. These are a lot of material laws. There are also mental laws, laws that have to do with lust, hate, greed, envy, jealousy, malice, mad ambition. These are mental laws. And the Master reveals that when you are under the law, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. When you are under the law, you have that coming back to you which you have sent forth. But his mission on earth was to reveal another kingdom where material laws and mental laws do not operate. So that we have the crippled man, we have a blind man to whom he says, open your eyes. That's not much of a treatment, not much of a prayer, not much of a going to God. Just open your eyes. And uh, the blind man saw. In other words, while that blind man was functioning only around other human beings, the law of matter operated and his blindness remained. The moment, however, he went into the atmosphere of one who had attained the spiritual consciousness, the material law had to disappear. So whether it is a material law, whether it is a, a mental law, since both of these come under the heading of good and evil, both must dissolve and disappear when they come into the atmosphere of an individual who has attained that spiritual consciousness. Now, the Master tells us that his purpose on earth was to bring us to that consciousness. And you will remember that he said, ye have heard it said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, resist not evil. Well, now you see, if you were on that Hebraic state of consciousness, level of consciousness, if you were on that material state of consciousness, you would be functioning in the realm of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, just as mankind does today. Steal a loaf of bread and go to jail. Steal a diamond and go for a shorter period. Steal a million dollars and go for less. But always it is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But when you come over into my kingdom, says the Master, which is not of this world, no longer is it an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but resist not evil. Or, instead of hating your enemy, punishing your enemy, seeking revenge, love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. All of which, remember, is foolishness to the human being on the human level of life. And no one can quite see how forgiving our enemies praying for our enemies is going to result in harmony, wholeness, completeness, and perfection coming into our experience. Or you cannot expect the human being to believe you when you say germs are not infectious or contagious. Germs are not destructive. Why? Well, haven't we got millions of people in hospitals and cemeteries all because of these 
infectious and contagious germs, these destructive germs. But when you come into the Christ presence, what happens? The germs disappear, they lose their power. And uh, <clears throat> you find then that it is literally true that there is no power really but God. In other words, the attainment of this fourth dimensional consciousness wipes out that which is considered law on the lower level. Now then, the master was crucified for taking that message to the people. Up to his time, truth was never given to the people. Well, of course, for one thing, they didn't have the education to understand it. Another thing, they worked from sunup to sundown. And when they did get in the house, they probably had other things on their mind than trying to attain spiritual consciousness. And uh, so there was uh, no teaching of the people. All of this wisdom was confined inside of the monasteries and the brotherhoods. But the master violated the uh, rules of his day and decided that this truth could be given to the people, that they would understand it. And of course he had a measure of success. He did prove that there were some able to receive this message. There was some able to respond to it and to demonstrate it. Of course, he practiced for a very short time, and, uh, but nevertheless, he left enough proof behind that his own disciples and their students and their students were able to perform miracle works for 300 years. Now, this teaching is lost sight of. And just for a moment let me backtrack to repeat that the teaching I'm speaking of is this, that every individual in the world has access to this fourth dimensional or Christ consciousness. The master phrased it this way, the kingdom of God is within you. And he spoke that broadly to everyone who heard him, not only the disciples. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, he acknowledged that this kingdom I'm talking about, my kingdom, is not of this world. You're never going to be able to handle it with your fingers, and you're never going to be able to learn it with your mind, because it isn't of this world. My kingdom is of the spiritual world, of this fourth dimensional world. He speaks of my peace. My peace give I unto thee, but not as the world giveth. Well, now that's a strange kind of peace, because the world, the peace that the world can give is affluence, fame, reputation, success, health, home, happy family, what more does anyone want? But he didn't include any of those in his peace. He didn't include any of those. In fact, at one time he said, if you don't leave those, you'll never find my peace, my kingdom. So we know that his teaching was based on the fact that this truth is uh, about your father and my father, not only these holy men, but your father and my father, the father that is within you, that we now learn is closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. So that we have established that from the earliest recorded time up to and including the time of the master and 300 years thereafter, we have known that the goal of life is the attainment of that spiritual consciousness. 
The goal of life is not attaining wealth or reputation or fame. The goal of life is attaining that fourth dimensional consciousness. Now, this never made for asceticism because anyone who ever attained that found automatically that harmony began to flow into their affairs and abundance, always with twelve baskets full left over. Everyone who has ever touched that realm of consciousness has been a better musician or a better artist or a better architect or a better lawyer or a better something or other than they ever could have been on their own responsibility or wisdom. So that by today really the entire world should be so spiritualized that all of the evils of the world should have disappeared. But unfortunately, the secret of the attainment of this mind has been lost always within one or two generations after its discovery or rediscovery. That is what has held the world back. One of the very first who had the revelation not only of this kingdom, the inner kingdom, and how to attain it, and what fruitage comes forth from it, was Gotama, the Buddha, the man who had his illumination and then discovered the greatest secret ever known to man. Nothing from before that day to this day, and I'm sure nothing in the future, will ever equal the discovery that he made or the revelation that was given to him in his illumination. And that was, of course, that the inner realm, the spiritual world, is a perfect and complete world and that what we have thought about this universe is maya or illusion. In other words, we hold an illusory concept of this world. With that revelation, he became the first of the well-known healers in the world. He went all over India doing mighty healing works. He not only did that, but he taught the secret to his disciples, and they did such wonderful healing works that within the 50 years that Gautama remained on earth, ashramas, temples, sprung up all over India, and in these healing works were carried on as well as all of the other works that come forth from an illumined consciousness. However, before he left this earth, he realized that his disciples or their students had lost it. And they lost it in uh, the same way that some of our modern metaphysicians have. When it is revealed that this world that the Master spoke of is an illusion, and my kingdom, the Christ kingdom, is not of this world, this world is an illusion. If you understand that, you can become a healer in five minutes, because it's the only secret necessary for anyone to know to make them a spiritual healer. That is, that what we perceive as this world is not this world at all because we are only seeing it through a glass darkly. We are seeing it through the finiteness of the third dimension. Now, the moment you know that, you take the next step and you realize, ah, then God did make all that was made 
and all that God made is good, even though I am seeing it through a glass darkly, even though I am seeing it in limited form or sickly form or deathly form. Ah, yes, but <clears throat> the glory that was India's was lost because this great teaching, this great revelation was twisted so that they began to say, oh, this world is an illusion. Oh, this body is an illusion. Well, let's not bother with this body. Let's not bother, bother getting rich. Let's not bother building a city. Oh, we don't need uh, water. We don't need irrigation. This is all illusion. Just wait long enough and we'll die out of it. And that is the teaching that remains in India to this day that causes even its holiest men to sit there diseased and unwilling to be healed because it's all illusion anyhow and as soon as they die they'll be out of the illusion. That is why they have resisted building cities and building dams and building aqueducts and building uh, modern equipment. Why this is all illusion. Well, it isn't. An illusion cannot be externalized. If you were crossing the desert in a car and all of a sudden saw an ocean of water in front of you, not knowing about deserts, it would undoubtedly cause you a great deal of concern. Unless somebody alongside of you said, don't worry, that's a mirage. Oh, well, then you drive right ahead. Why? Because a mirage cannot be externalized. If you were with an alcoholic while he was in delirium tremens and he was fighting these snakes, you would say to him, stop it, stop it, resist not snakes. They have no power. In fact, there aren't any. That's an illusion. Well, of course, he wouldn't agree with that because he's not only seeing them, he's feeling them and probably smelling them in his imagination. But you know that they are imagination. Therefore, you know they are illusion. Therefore, you know that they have no external form. They have no external existence. They have no externalization of any nature. You know that, and therefore you don't fear them, and in your lack of fear, pretty soon even your patient wakes up. Now, many modern metaphysicians approach their work from the standpoint that this world is an illusion and that sin, disease, and death are illusion, and then, of course, they want to get rid of the illusion. Any of you who have practiced know that you get calls continuously, oh, I'm suffering from this illusion, will you help me get rid of this illusion? After you've declared it's an illusion, what more is there? Since an illusion can't be a thing or a person or a condition, it can only be an image and thought without substance, without cause, without reality. Now, we come back then to this, that in the presence of enlightenment, the darkness disappears. The man or woman on the next seat to you in the car who has the light to say to you, this isn't water, this is mirage, awakens you, or we shall call it, heals you. The metaphysician who has developed enough spiritual consciousness to be aware of the fact that God is infinite and that God is omnipotent also knows that besides omnipotence there can't be anything else. And therefore, regardless of the nature of the appearance, can rest quietly 
in that inner assurance of the unreality of these appearances and then the patient is awakened and realizes too that these things only existed in a false sense so let's come back now to this that every individual on the face of the globe has within themselves the kingdom of God or the Christ consciousness the task of each one of us is to break through our material sense that says the mirage is real or break through our mental sense that says one mirage can cause uh, something else until we reach that spiritual realm until we develop within ourselves the fourth dimensional consciousness and then your treatment does not have to take on the form of words or thoughts or if you're not in the healing work your concern for your profession, your business, your art all disappears because now you know that in the presence of this enlightened consciousness only enlightenment or intelligence, wisdom, love can come forth so from earliest times to the present moment we have this revelation the kingdom of God is within you there is a present possibility for each one of us to attain in some measure this enlightened consciousness now we cannot all attain it equally there is no such thing as equality among us and the reason is that some of us want it so badly that we will sacrifice days and nights to get it we will give up the opportunity of earning money we will do anything and everything that appears as a possibility in order to attain this and we will attain it <clears throat> there are others who would surely love to attain it and are perfectly willing to study an hour a day they too will attain a grain but even a grain in this generation is a tremendous experience now the question arises how does one attain it and uh, this I can only give to you from personal experience in other words I am not laying down a rule which says that this is the only way there may be dozens of ways but this is the way that worked itself out in my experience and uh, which I have been passing on to our students for 30 years or nearly that the first step toward receiving enlightenment lies in a practice that brother Lawrence called practicing the presence of God now in my own experience it worked out not quite the way brother Lawrence worked his out <clears throat> in quite a different way and with different results but the principle is the same on waking in the morning instead of either lying there daydreaming or jumping out of bed quickly to get ready for the day remain there for about five minutes and begin immediately to reach out to that word God let that word God come into your consciousness and uh, then see what unfolds from there something along this line of God 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 is where I am or this is the day the Lord hath made this must be a good day 
God governs my day. The place whereon I stand is holy ground, for God is here. God is to be the activity of this day. God is to be the all in all of my day. Ah, oh, yes, yes. It says, Lean not unto thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. I acknowledge God as having given me my rest and sleep. I recognize God as bringing me to awakeness. I recognize God as having brought daylight after night. I recognize God is functioning in the incoming and outgoing of the tides. I recognize God, even if the trees outside are barren right now in January, I know that God is something doing something about it for a few weeks, a few months, and there will be buds and blossoms and fruit. I know that God is at work in every phase of life, regardless of any appearances to the contrary. We are out and we make our physical preparations for the day and we come to breakfast. And here we have to give pause because there is a temptation to believe uh, that we have that breakfast because we had money to buy it. No, no money wouldn't grow it. No, it took God functioning through nature. And so we can say, God can set a table in the wilderness. And God does set my table regardless of the human activities of my day. We prepare to leave the house, whether for marketing or shopping or whether for business. Always we are to pause at the door before we go through it to realize that the presence has gone before me, the presence that prepares a place for me, the presence that makes the crooked places straight. I am my own self, cannot do very much in this day, except that the grace of God goes with me and before me. We have duties to perform, tasks to perform, labors to perform, and how wonderful it is then to realize he performeth that which is given me to do. He perfecteth that which concerneth me. He that is within me is greater than any of these problems of the day. And so on throughout the day and on into the night, some acknowledgement of God. And we are thereby fulfilling scripture which says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And also acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will give thee peace. And finally the master in the 15th chapter of John, if you abide in this word, if you let this word abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. If you do not abide in it, if you do not let it abide in you, you will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. So it is then that we go through days and weeks of consciously bringing to remembrance the word God and the importance of God, the need for God, the reliance on God, the function of God in our experience. And it only takes days, a week, or two, three, until we find that an inner stillness has developed within us, an inner peace that we never knew before, an inner assurance that something greater than ourselves is on the field. Then we come to our second step, which is meditation. Now, until one has found an inner peace, an inner quiet, they will find meditation impossible. The human mind just won't be still. But if through the practice of that presence of God, 
and inner stillness is attained, then meditation is very simple. You sit down and uh, ponder some idea of God, whatever comes into your mind for a few minutes, and then quiet, and you are in meditation, receptive and responsive to whatever may come in to you, from within you. Remember, everything now is taking place within you. The kingdom of God is within you. This quiet is established within you. This peace is established within you. And finally, the impartations come to you from within you. And uh, when this begins to happen, you start your life of living by grace rather than under the law. And you will now find that the physical laws and mental laws which functioned so strongly in your experience begin now to lessen and you are less subject to material and mental laws and more and more receptive to the spiritual. And so this goes on until eventually you discover this that where as before you were blind now you see where as before you had a darkened material consciousness that loved hated or feared that which existed in the visible realm now all of a sudden your consciousness is so enlightened that you can look out here and say I shall not fear what mortal man can do to me I will not put my faith in princes I will not lean on that which is external on that which is visible for now I have discovered that all that is visible is made of the substance which is invisible and so from now on the reliance is on your own enlightened consciousness, your own developed spiritual consciousness. And then you can understand why the master could say, I am the bread and I am the wine, I am the meat, I am the water. In other words, I embody my good within my own being. And instead of trying to get it from out there from people, instead of trying to get it up there from God, I understand now what it means uh, open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. For all of the good that can ever flow into anyone's life is at this moment stored up in their consciousness. And all that is necessary is for them to find a way to open out so that it can flow out from within them and the way is naturally attaining some measure even a grain of this illumined consciousness you see <clears throat> scripture speaks of the man of earth and then the man who has his being in Christ the man of earth is the darkened mortal consciousness the man who has his being in Christ is probably that same man after the illumination, just as we have seen it with uh, Gautama, who was only a man, and then in the moment of illumination became the leader of an entire nation. We see it with Moses, who was only a shepherd, only a man, but in one brief moment of illumination, he becomes the whole leader of the Hebrew people and is empowered to take them out of slavery into freedom. We find it with Christ Jesus, who is a Hebrew rabbi. But with illumination, he becomes the whole of the world's hope. Not only in the Christian world, but as you travel the rest of this world, you find out how the rest of the world also realizes that the revelation of Jesus Christ is the hope of all the world. A man, a man, a student, a rabbi. But no, with illumination, he's no longer the son of man, he's the son of God. No longer is he Jesus, but Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the son 
of God. So you'll find in your experience that there are housewives and there are clerks and there are businessmen and professional men and they're just men and women. And then you find that they turn to a metaphysical or a spiritual teaching and they work with it faithfully, conscientiously, consistently and then all of a sudden they are healers and teachers and you say what what brought this about well it wasn't their human learning because if they could memorize this whole Bible they probably couldn't heal a headache with it if they could memorize all of the metaphysical textbooks that have ever been written I doubt that it would help them to heal a headache but the moment that their reading of the Bible or their reading of their textbook goes a step further into practicing these principles, they begin to develop this consciousness and their darkened mind or spirit or consciousness becomes illumined. And in one moment they make the transition from just a man or woman to a healer, which is the equivalent of the Christ, the Savior, that which forgives, that which transforms, that which raises the dead. All of this is the enlightened consciousness of an individual. Now our experience shows this. First of all, we as students must have presented to us certain specific principles of practice. I'm sure that all of the metaphysical movements have their particular ones. We in our work have the book the Practicing the Presence which is our textbook on that subject. We have the Art of Meditation which is our textbook on that subject. Now as we practice faithfully these particular principles, not merely reading them or memorizing them, putting them into practice, all of a sudden enlightenment begins to dawn and we say, whereas I was blind, now I see. Now I know what an illusion is. It isn't anything out here. Can't be. An illusion is nothing more or less than a non-existing mental image something that has no substance, no law, no cause. So it is when you're called upon to heal and you realize certainly God couldn't have made a disease therefore the very appearance must be illusory and so you can start in not to remove the illusion but to smile at it in the realization of the fact that now you know the nature of mirage or illusion and you know why Jesus Christ said bless them that curse you forgive them that do evil unto you resist not evil why? <laughs> it has no power unless you in the three dimensional mind give it power so just to briefly sum up here we are each one a potential Buddha or a potential Christ each one with a full capacity for spiritual enlightenment each one of us with a consciousness that goes beyond the physical and the mental and uh, then the next question is what will I do about it and the answer to that is uh, what do we want out of life now <clears throat> we can go as far as we like or we can start with this and when we get to the stage where we see a few little miracles some loaves and fishes a few healings happier home we can stop and say well I've arrived or 
we can look ahead into that master's revelation which says that my kingdom is not of this world. So even if you have more money or a happier marriage or a nicer family or a better home, that still is not my world. And then you get curious about what my world is like. And once that curiosity is aroused, there's no more rest. No more rest. Not on earth, anyhow. But joyous experiences come for this reason. And it's all worthwhile. The moment that you attain a measure, a slight measure, of this spiritual consciousness, you will find that material and mental laws fade at your presence. 